Not much. Do you guys just what? get here? Yeah, 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 we just just joined there. Yeah. What do you think about some of the things I've been posting regarding EVs? I've been looking into them. They, they seem to be absolutely a, a disaster waiting to happen, just l both industrially, logistically, economically, everything you could think of. Well, that's why I don't, like, you know, <laughs> we already knew. <laughs> Everybody knew. Yeah. Since the start, you know, and, and it's not even like... You know, at, at my levels, it's all rumors. I, I'm deciphering how many rumors I hear and what seems to be more, you know, what source it's coming from, which person. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's why I talk about, like, the engines that were get 600 miles to the gallon. Like, the, you know, they were chopping those out back in the early 2000s. Uh, Obviously, they're not going to put them on the road, though, because it'll kill the the whole gas industry. Like, you, you don't, mm -hmm. it, it's way less fill up, way less, you know, the barrels of gasoline would just diminish, right? And that that's, like, understandable to an extent. But the thing is, is over the last 40 years, our efficiency in motors hasn't increased at all, right? Yeah. It, it's like, what, cars sit around... I, I don't know what your numbers are over there, but it's like cars are 30 miles per gallon. Trucks are, these light ones are 20, heavy ones are 10, and, and that's it, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and we've been just running this way forever, saying that we're going to run out of gas and oil every 10 years, just like the environment and every other cataclysm is going to kill us yeah. in 10 years. So it's like, well... All right, if we just wipe all the fear porn out of it and look at it logically from what's presented, it's like we would be fine just running gas and oil uh, pretty indefinitely because I am pretty sure we produce it at this point. And the EV stuff, I think it was like, just like I was talking about with Cosmics, I think it's like a slaughtered fattened calf that they've been building up. That's where I mean, like, the auto companies yeah. are acting all lost now, just like the banks did 15 yeah, exactly. years ago during yeah. the big short, right? Mm -hmm. they, they're looking for the bailout now. They want to get the bailout money the banks got. It, it, it seems very strange as well, because you're, you're beginning to see, and I, I, there's, again, these are merely rumors that I'm hearing, but it, it, they seem to be picking up momentum regarding the insurance companies don't seem to be too uh, interested in insuring um, electric vehicles or it's at very extremely high premiums and um, you're seeing things for example uh, even with hybrids this is the case of course the battery is uh, within a compartment underneath the, you know, on, on the underbelly of the car. But if you go over, uh, you know, speed bumps or anything like that, or you go over anything that may cause even the slightest uh, superficial damage to that compartment, then, or to the underbelly of the car, then essentially it's a write off at that point. Um, I, I believe it's because of the diagnostic information on a lot of these EVs. Uh, most pronouncedly of Tesla, that is all contained in house uh, in terms of the diagnostic machines and you know all of that. Um, and also the batteries are very complex. The cells that are u utilized uh, or the cell structures that are utilized within the batteries, I mean there's I forget the number now in terms of the amount of cells that make up these these you know uh, individual batteries. Um, I mean, they're extremely expensive to repair as well. Now, of course, that's to get everyone off the road. I mean, you can see the logic in terms of, you know, as transitioning to a, a cybernetic, transhumanist, um, neo-feudalist, capitalist dystopia or whatever term we want to use. But it seems as though you're beginning to see, like what you're saying, the car manufacturers are beginning to reverse gear too. Insurance is beginning, you know, insurance companies are beginning to reverse gear. Um, people are actively talking about 
the EV market is a bubble that's waiting to burst. Now, of course, we have lots of bubbles that mire the, the, the modern Western economy, even the economy at this present moment. Um, I mean, yeah, it's like what you're saying. It's probably they're, they're after the bailout money. Uh, they're, tr- they're trying to m- sort of uh, milk the dead cow, flog the dead horse. I mean, yeah. what, what analogy do we want to use? But yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I I was watching um, a thing on uh, drum drum companies drum factories like musical instrument drum drum kits that are manufactured around the world and like the all all those guys that play drums are drum nerds and you know you can watch the factory tours now uh, for like Ludwig drums in America uh, Pearl drums in Japan Tama drums in Japan Sonar drums in Germany. And uh, you know, it's just a kind of interesting thing to see how they how they put the, the the drum shells together and how they make the actual the kit, like the drum set. But uh, the guy in Sonar that they were talking to in Germany, he said in the I think it was the eighties when the Simmons pad and D drum came out, uh, like they they told the industry, the drum manufacturing industry, that electronic drums are going to wipe you out. Nobody's going to be playing acoustic drum kits anymore. So at that time, there was a big scare on that, uh, you know, wooden shell drum kits were going to be a thing in the past and everybody was going to be playing uh, uh, electronic kits. But like as time goes on, uh, the point he was making is that, you know, acoustic drums are still very much, you know, in the market or whatever. Yeah, the electronic drums have their place, but like they'll never replace an acoustic instrument. But he kind of, he was just making that point, like at the time, every, everybody was in fear, fear mode in the industry where they manufactured drums. But the point he kind of made in a way, in a roundabout way, like what I took from what he said was the electronic kit co- kind of cornered a certain element of the market. And as I see it, the, the, the established brands like Sonar, for example, in Germany, uh, kind of knuckled down on quality and started to, to produce a more a, a real high spec instrument so to buy like a, a high end set of pretty much any any drum set now uh, from one of the bigger companies at the higher end you're talking you know four or five th- three four thousand euro five thousand euro maybe more you know uh dw in in america another example but the point being that like when you have these uh, new trends and they threatened to dislodge, you know, like the electronic cars threatening to dislodge, you know, the, you know, the diesel petrol engine car. Um, you know, it, it may not necessarily pan out that way because, you know, the consumer wants choice at the end of the day and um, it's all dependent. But like, I suppose the, the X factor in this stuff is tax around stuff like, um, and the green greenhouse stuff around, uh, you know, fossil fuels or whatever you want to call it, diesel or petrol, et cetera, that that might be used as a political battering ram to, to force, enforce the kind of e-car kind of uh, agenda, if you will. And I know it ties in with that kind of whole smart city thing where, you know, you've less, you know, less capacity to move around and mm-hmm. you're more dependent on the electrical grid, really, the available energy. So does does that's a, another factor in it? Like, but it it, it it's it, let's see how it pans out. You know, over ten or t- the next ten or twenty years, probably ten years, we'll we we'll have a good picture. Ten or fifteen years of a good picture of uh, where th- things are going to go. Because like they have ideas, but the market and the public and the masses kind of have their own mindset, and uh, it all depends. I think you know. You can see that sort of friction, that abrasiveness that it's causing within society. Just, of course, that's just a microcosm of this grander sort of macrocosmic divide between the the people and the political class right now. And it's it's ro- not really even the political class. I mean, it's a sort of priest class, an intellectual class who, I mean, among other things, I mean, we can we can talk about the tikkun or the great work or all of these sort of esoteric concepts for the transition um, you know, between the, the sort of 
the the world that has come before the natural world and the world that shall go into this sort of death of God transition, where they shall become detached from God, or that sort of uh, conscious force that main keeps us human, and shall be merged to I don't know maybe a, a digital mechanism, a, a digital system, the internet of all things, or you know whatever uh, they they plan, but. This intellectual class, they seem to be control freaks and they seem to want to have total unbridled control over everyone because the only way the, control, the, the intellectual class can maintain their, uh, their sort of need uh, within society, not their needs, but their, their special status within, within society is to control people and, and to control their uh, their power, their agency to make their own decisions. So the only thing the intellectual class can provide is ideas, is, uh, is, is that sort of des- decision-making uh, um, power. So they have to essentially abrogate, take away, totally abolish all agency from the citizen. Now, you do that through multiple means. I mean, the CBDC, uh, it's a full frontal attack, essentially. You've got the CBDC system, which is uh, the abrogation of all um, all, all decision-making uh, power, all agency from the citizen in terms of their economic and financial future. You've got the, the, the same thing that has been done even with voting, um, even with uh, for example, getting into Congress or getting into any Parliament. I mean, there's essentially you, you have to, you know, sort of suck up to to special interest groups. You, there's a certain financial ceiling as well. I mean, you need investment from these special interest groups. So they've cut off that avenue too. Uh, that agency has been taken away from the citizenry. And then finally, you've got the, the travel. They don't want people to travel. Um, they want the 30 minute cities they want us isolated closed in, they want man to be an island that is connected to this central, uh, centralised grid this internet of all things because that is, that is the only way within, this, within that vacuum that they create like Yal Dabawath, the begetter of the void they, when they beget this void, this digital void they shall take away all potential uh, agency from the c- citizenry, which will ensure their power into perpetuity. Because the again, the intellectual class, all they have are ideas. That's all they can offer. All they can offer is you know their um, their decision making, right? Um, if if they if they ba- if they divest that decision making to the citizenry. I mean, that totally takes away from their power. That potentially may uproot them from their, you know, um, their, their special status within society. But I think that's another avenue, you know, aspect to all of this as well. Well, it's, it's interesting to, like, kind of ponder how much of this can they successfully achieve without the use of force, like, without a war a war type scenario where you can shoot your enemy effectively you know kill your enemy so if you're in society where you're trying to softly engineer things into the new normal or the, the future or, you know it just remains to be seen how successful the great work shall be or might be because Without the use of force, probably early on in the twentieth century, you you had wars. You know, you had you had war in Russia, you had war in Europe, and um, you know that was used as a pretext to engineer the the world that we're in. But like, if we assume, and it may be not fair to assume, but if we assume that 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 they're moving forward without using that option now, that they're trying to softly engineer the thing, it just remains to be seen how far they can push it. Uh, how successful they can be, but as you kind of say, there, if they're creating this economic prison and this atomization, 
of the of, of people and the fracturing of society and the miscegenation and all the rest of it, the postmodern kind of post structural uh, narrative. You know, it remains to be seen how successful that might may be from their point of view. Because, you know, as I was saying in the last conversation, when you're working with natural materials, be it carving a piece of wood or trying to shape human society, like every once in a while you're prone to that natural material kind of kicking back or not going. Yeah. The timber doesn't split the way you wanted it to split. Mm -hmm. It splits along the grain or you hit a knot or it still is a natural uh, element that you're trying to shape. So with even with all the best predictive stuff that they have and the psychological stuff and the the algorithm and you know the the, the data, mm -hmm. it's still they may find themselves more in a reactive situation than uh, you know actively moving forward in a given direction, going from plant point to point on a premeditated graph because the the plan may not work out. As yeah. they've hoped, you know, so so that puts them in a weird situation there then where they're kind of chasing their own tail or they're trying to react all the time or they're trying to go to plan B all the time. So it's like it, it just may not be that easy for them to, to maneuver. And if it if it isn't, if they find themselves in that scenario, which I think is a possibility, then you may see that the gloves will come off, that they may go to ever more drastic measures to try and mm -hmm. uh you know get the ship to sail in the direction they wanted to sail in you know so perfect. let's see perfect i like the ship mm. reference uh like zeal i mean it's almost like they're you know captains of the ship and they're basically trying to convince us to go below deck and sit on the shitty benches and row yeah. the oars to move their ship and, for, yeah. and like mm -hmm. we keep coming back up and they just find new ways to send us back down no the the the, the sort of more worrying evidence that the, if you look at the man or woman on the street they'll tell you that the world is in shit like you know i went down to the butcher the other day and he, mm -hmm. you know the footfall is decreased in our local town here and they're trying to put a, a big shopping mall and you know, there's so many things that the 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 the, the, the miscegenation, the, the the doors are open on the country here, so we're flooded every day from people from different countries who are trying to make a living or you know escape poverty or hardship in their own countries, which is fair enough. But that's what we feel is not why this is being done. We're, we feel it's been done to modify and re-engineer our society. Um. So, you know, it, it, the point being, if you look, if you talk to people around you or you look around you in your immediate kind of environs, you don't get a very good picture of your society. Well, certainly here, and I'm sure it's the same perhaps in America or, in, you know, in Scotland or the UK or wherever. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Oh, the, so the pennies then, aren't the drop. Yeah. So yeah. does you. No, no, no. It's. Uh, it's just, you know, we see it. We see it on the, so it, we see, we can see an element of it is working. It's actually working. The plan is working on the street because you can kind of see it like, you know, and the temperature in society is, the canker is there and the, like the atomization thing is not just a disconnect. It's also sort of a self-hatred, a kind of a, there's a negative thing creeping in where the regard that people have for each other is perhaps not at an optimum level. You know, competition is higher, and a society is not happier. Is not happy in a, in a good place as such, really. So, you get this kind of friction between people, uh, be it work colleagues, family members, relationships, neighbor, the guy in the in the shop, or whatever. You see it around you a lot more. And um, there's a kind of I think there's a kind of a how do I say a, a lack of regard, or there's a kind of a cheapness there, or something. There's something missing that was there. There's some value has been dulled or whatever kind of yeah the, the so culture you, the culture has died we there's yeah. no communal spirit i mean the, there's i mean the electric vehicle thing is a prime example of that the electric uh, you know pads or electric drums is another example when you begin to move from that which is more natural 
you end up inevitably drifting into the territory of sort of uh, sterility, um, where well, the, the the culture becomes civilization. The culture dies, and from its husk is born this sort of uh, chimera, this distorted, uh, inhuman um, form, this this civilization, this thing that is sterile. And, and inevitably what you get is, like what you're saying, um, atomization, uh, the emergence of dystopia, the moving yeah. away from not even democracy, but more a more nationalistic, um, prideful, in, in a sort of positive sense, um, patriotic, you, you move towards just pure autocracy that's, that views society, it views humans in a mechanistic format where it sees everything as a sort of binary, uh, ones and zeros, and it sees how can, how can I turn this distort this uh, culture or this society into a more efficient machine to produce me uh, profit uh, and also that, that profit is, is measured in power as well um, and power is obviously is, is determined by the longevity of, of you know being at the apex of the hierarchy of this society so I mean, inevitably, what what you get into is uh, this this problem that we see within every single empire when it reaches the terminus of its life cycle, which is um, the bu the bureaucratic class, the intellectual class, become totally detached from reality because they see everything mechanistically. They don't see um, they don't see that innate quality that exists within every humans every human being that um, you know it, it, like what you're saying Zeal like when you're working in with, you're working with natural material you might hit that knot you might hit that unpredictable element um, and of course that's what they're seeking to get rid of as well but I mean they'll, they'll obviously fail I mean it's the dream of every despot throughout history um, to destroy that innate uh, essence of, I mean, you can call it the first principle, God, the detachment from the source, from consciousness. I mean, it's, oh. it's that which makes us human. They try to steal that away, but inevitably, they're it's they're they're not going to. I don't think they're going to destroy that. With the thirty-minute cities or the fifteen-minute cities or what you know, whatever uh, term they they use, even with the the sustainable development goals of Agenda Twenty Thirty, all that's going to do is they're not going to get rid of the human spirit um, because it's still, it's still quite a ways off in terms of them bringing in this internet of all things. All they're going to do is sort of isolate the human, push it into a corner. Um, they're going to try, you know, push it down, clamp it down, right? But this, that pressure, that force doesn't go away. When you push down on it, it merely... Um, sort of stores up kinetic energy then inevitably it reaches a threshold where you can no longer you know um, sort of hold it down and then it springs back um, I think that's what's going to happen you're, you're actually starting to I'm seeing it as well more and more normal people if you will they're beginning to understand that there's something gravely wrong in society and there is there's a massive disconnect between all sectors of society, not just between the, the nativist and uh, non-nativist elements, but between every element of society. Um, and it's becoming, you know, a, a them and us mentality, which obviously is, is uh, that's going to lead to conflagration of, at some point, you know. Just to offer another possible scenario in the dynamic is as you compress the society, um, it begins to implode and it starts to develop this cancer within itself where like and I've seen a little bit of this working with um, disadvantaged communities in the past that were minority communities for example in Ireland that were 
that went through poverty and were on the sidelines and the margins and having worked with them and within them. Um, you know, you, you see this culture where there's a kind of, a self hate is what I describe it as as a kind of a uh, a loss of pride, a loss of dignity, a kind of an implosion on in, in the family structure. You know, and, and a kind of a it begins to it's like a tree that you deprive of light and water. It just starts to starting to rot from 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 within. So scenario A, as you point out, might be a spring back, which would be the optimum scenario. That would be healthy, possibly not uh, very peaceful, but would be better than what I'm talking about, which is scenario B, which is a kind of an implosion. So that uh, instead of that energy being reflected out into a reaction, it it's contained within and held within, and it develops into this cancerous uh, element within the society that society society starts to implode on top of itself, and that's highly unhealthy for us and extremely beneficial for them because you know we're doing their job for them at that point. Like so, it it remains to be seen in the long term how how will the culture pan out in that manner? You know, it's foreseeable that an element of the culture possibly will uh, collapse into that state implode into that state and it's foreseeable it's it's possibly foreseeable that another aspect of the culture would uh to use your term kind of you know reflect outwards or, or rebound or you know hammer back so to speak but h- how all that actually manifests is, is yet another question mm-hmm. and it's back to the power broker how he or she can foresee this can he can they control it can they guide it etc etc so you know we don't have to look too far back in the history book to see that they have done that many times you know they have Mm -hmm. anticipated this stuff and like the worrying thing is with the availability availability of the data that possibly they have the forecastability for this stuff but uh to hit on a point you made in an earlier conversation silas when technology tends to dic- dictate the whole vibe, like the whole way you operate, like the tools of your trade um, at, at a certain point in time dictate to you how you how you operate. So it's like a, a musician going into a studio and he's got all these buttons and stuff that, you know, there's different reverbs, delays, there's compression, there's mastering stuff, there's, there's all this stuff. And they, you just get lost in this stuff and you forget, hold on, I'm supposed to be playing the guitar here, you know. So likewise with them. They're in a scenario now where they're wholly dependent, shall we say, on the algorithm, just to use a sim- simplified way of understanding it. So they have this mechanism, they have this machine that they're dependent on to achieve, you know, the great work. But mm-hmm. that machine itself kind of paints them into a corner as to how they move because they're, they're seeing through it. So it may be that they, you know, there's something coming in around the corner that they, they haven't uh accounted for or they, they haven't pre- they don't have the predictability on it so that those kinds of scenarios may play out and they may you see it's not necessarily good news either because if things don't go to plan for them and they find themselves up shit creek shall we say that's not necessarily good news because that might the gloves might come off from their point of view then and our society itself may be reacting in a way that would be, uh, you know, violent, for example. So we, we may find find ourselves mm-hmm. in chaos, actually, if the plan doesn't go the way they want it to go. And we may, may find ourselves in dark times indeed. But it's all a matter of, you know, how the thing is going to plan out. Like the timber, you you they've hit the axe into that piece of timber and it is going to split. And the question is, is it going to split the way they want it to split? That's what remains to be seen. So, you know, I think at the moment we're, there's a certain element of it is in uncharted territory, but the hubris and the, you know, the, the, the self grandiose self belief and the, you know, the, they're drunk on it. Like, so, so, um, you know, if they get a shock, let's see, let's see how it, how it pans out. Like, you know. Yeah. I know what you're <clears throat> kind of getting at, Zeal, with the, uh, you know, this type of machine 
idea that you're talking about on the micro scale, uh, like at Ford, for instance, or even Chrysler, or BMW, they all That's... have a system, right? A, a machine, a, a software. It, I, I wouldn't even know. It, it's a whole network in itself. It's kind of it's it's got its own server and everything for like the world like i can get on that server and look at all the ford plants all over the place right look for parts i can see what they're building i can look at their assembly lines and see what's running not running fords is called fis it's like ford information system that's it and that's what I noticed the first day that I ever stepped in one of their plants or any other facility that used some type of software like that. Every employee there became wholly dependent on it. It kind of reminds me of uh, pretty much any driver under 40 and GPS nowadays. Right? And like the system's faulty. That's the problem. I'm one of the only people I, I don't even use it. Other than that, it's kind of like out on the assembly lines. There's bingo boards or TVs and stuff with various screens that'll show you things from it. You know, it's almost like the Matrix, right? It's got all these different screens with the codes and numbers and stuff all over the place. But. I don't actually, I don't log into my computer and go access this thing and sit there. And like a lot of people do, they'll just sit and look at it and just do all of their managerial stuff from the office. And so what's incurred is that now they can promote <clears throat> all these unqualified people to all sorts of positions because now they can just go sit in the office and stare at a screen and yell over the radio or their phone all these different things going on and direct people and stuff without actually having any knowledge or know-how or of the inner workings of anything right other than what this software tells them this is the problem as well with outsourcing um human ingenuity um, human intelligence, not not just in terms of knowledge, but actually outsourcing decision making to uh, AI systems. And you, you're seeing things come out of DARPA, for example, uh, where they talk about wireless optogenetic nano networks, right? Um, which which can be in, in planted or infused within the brain, vis-a-vis -vis nasal spray, right? So. You're you're getting into getting into the crux of it. That when you take something that is, for example, the human being, it is an analog system. It's a system that has a degree of unpredictability. Uh, it is a, the way it functions. It could be best expressed as a waveform. And you put that into a binary form, um, when you have to, again, compress or narrow or uh, totally contort society or the social construct which is born out of that analogue expression of the human being in a psychological sense, then what you're going to get is you're going to get chaos. Um, now... I totally agree, Zeal, they've anticipated this. They're probably tapering it with technologies, um, you know, with also traditional uh, methodology in terms of psychological manipulation, mimetic warfare, all of this, uh, ov obviously as well, controlled opposition groups. And they're attempting to also subvert vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, for example, um, you know, social media, algorithms, all of these various other technological um, methods that they have now to, to taper, to change society, to create a soft landing strategy um, for the Agenda 2030 and Agenda 2050 and the, the entire Agenda 21 uh, for the, tw you know, the 21st century. But inevitably, 
I, j I just can't. They're already. See, their tools are already become, becoming blunt, it seems. I think a lot of people are beginning to. I think they're beginning to see through the veil. I think there's a sort of revelation. <laughs> Not to be biblical about it, but there's, there is. It's a revelation. Um, you know, the, from the Latin, which I, I believe means to pierce the veil, to see through the veil. Um, I think the illusion's breaking. A lot of their traditional methodologies are, I mean, they're, they're totally moot at this point. For example, mainstream, the mainstream media, how much swaying power does that actually have? Apart from, say, corporations, companies, all of these uh, mercantilist uh, enterprises. Uh, and that class there, but with the the majority of normal people, the you know the vast horde of citizens, it doesn't have much swaying power. Um, I don't think. I think it's starting to lose it uh, precipitously. When we look at, for example, social media, that is more subtle in terms of how they control. So you saw it with Trump, for example, in the whole uh, Q anon thing. But I don't think people are going to get stung like that again. I, I think, I think there's a sizable um, contingent of people, not a majority. I mean, it's still a minority, but a sizable contingent that have saw that saw through that. They saw what Trump was about. They understand that left and right are merely the the sort of uh, <laughs> you know that's the that's the way you move towards the, it's the totalitarian tiptoe. The left foot and then the right foot, you know. Um, you're, you're moving towards the sort of end goal that they desire if you buy into that uh, paradigm. Says there, you know, you know? Um, with, 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 you know, working in the, in the automo automobile plant and the reliance on the systems, um, after a while, you know, a certain culture enters the corporation and the manufacturing process and it it bleeds into everything and it has a you can kind of taste it in the air you get to know it and it becomes familiar and you 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 have a disdain for it perhaps and you know you get sick of it really but it, it dominates the whole industry and uh you know just as a footnote similarly back to the example of manufacturing a musical instrument drums you know the cnc stuff the computer stuff the barcodes the laser guided machines everything's on a computer uh when you're when you're drilling the of the art processes with you know minute difference minute minute differences from company so, to company sorry deal J just repeat that again you you went um you went off there sorry. just at the sorry yeah, it's just the point I'm I'm trying to make overall is effectively they're in, engaged in a, in a social engineering kind of slash social or you know uh, how do you say it information to successfully kind of um, roll that out they need the aspect of camouflage and and subterfuge they, they don't want to be seen or known. But they're becoming ever more perceptible because people are getting clued into that kind of culture and the feel of it has a certain feel. It has a, it has a certain kind of almost like a smell, and you know it's them. And like the and like you can fool some of the people some of the time, but by virtue of the fact that they become wholly reliant on that system, their fingerprints are becoming clearer and clearer, and people start to see through it. So that's a major problem for them. Like the, it's a bit like Blitzkrieg. Um, you know, you made certain tactical advantages uh, for a time, but you can't you can't keep going with that because it just doesn't work in the long run. Because it's okay for short term, uh, uh, you know, tactical advances, but not in the long term. You know, maybe that's what all the bunkers are for. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I think so. I think I, mean, I think like is the well. purge, right? Like it's more of like a horror film for the elite. If you really think about it. 
But like the, the ironic question mm. is an, what happens if they fail? That's an ironic thing to like, think. What, for, well, suppose like the, the great work doesn't work. I uh, suppose they fuck up and they don't they don't get where they want to go. What then? What happens to society? You know, they're in disarray. Um, the the plan has gone up in smoke. The system has turned out to be a failure. What then? What then for society? You know, I think it's sorry. <laughs> yeah, jump in, man. Hey, everyone. <laughs> Hi, man. Um, well, I I personally uh, think and observe that um, they get so much uh, investment into reforging past history to seem like they've been in power all this time, to seem like they've been a success all this time, that um, I think that they've always failed. And basically what happened at each time this uh, was attempted was that power um, shifted hands to the other side, and the other side basically acted acted it out the same way, and rewrote history, and um, kept the same methods, and did the same things. Because it's like we were talking, I mean, some time ago, if you are given a position, um, we can talk here and say, no, we would do differently and this and that. But when you're given a position, the temptation is so strong. Only the really, really the, let's call it, and this is just a word, the pure would be able to resist. Because the, mm. the consequences or the alternative to not do it is to probably be uh, uh, completely taken over by that wave that you guys are talking about. And so, and this is, of course, a, an observation. I'm not saying that it's, of course, the truth. It's just my observation. Is that um, one of the greatest points that they try to insist on in history and that's come to the fore, especially in the, uh, let's call it, conspiracy kind of circles, is that they've been in power um, since forever. This is basically the key point that more or less every conspiracy agrees upon. Right? And so uh, I would contend that if we remove that element, if we say, well, let's consider that that's fake too. Let's consider that that's false history, that that was rewritten in the same, in the same way that, for example, the uh, uh, theory of evolution right, was put in exactly to extend um, and, and make human life less valuable and to extend into a distance. a pre-human kind of thing when I th I think it's well fairly obvious that of course there's not uh, there's not no such thing as evolution or a, a shift from a species to another right so everything that was in the past was there as a creation let's say as a manifestation of something but that's a different point what I'm trying to say is then that um, if you really remove, even if it's just for the sake of argument, the idea that they've been in power forever, and consider, for example, that power shifted hands, let's say, 200, 300 years ago, just for the sake of argument, and that 300 years ago, there was a boiling point more or less like we're, we're reaching now. And that power shifted hands because it failed. The gamble failed. And it fails every time because it's not supposed to be won. And what happens then is the other side, who was the shadow of the side in power, or if you like, 
the reflection, because in, in fact, the sight and power acts like a shadow. So it would be the other way around. But so a reflection, the other side uh, took the opportunity and took power. And then when they found themselves there, they realized, oh, but this is the only way we can prevent these guys from taking it back again. Right? And so if, if uh, you're faced with that, the intellectuals, let's say, of that group that takes power um, will perhaps decide that, well, at least we'll, uh, we'll keep it in our hands. At least we'll prevent this great evil from coming back. And so you have this great, after these periods, I'm sure you'll have this great religious fervor of witch hunting, of seeking out the enemy and the wrong thinking of people in the, in the society that you take control from. Let's try to eradicate all those that sympathize with the, the, the enemy that tried to do this. And then that's basically the, uh, the downfall. That's probably the first step of, uh, of a downfall, uh, morally speaking. Eternal conundrum, it just revolves mm -hmm. and revolves. And like the corridors of power and the halls of power, it's like an empty palace. It's eternal. It's always there. It's just, it's who populates it. You know who gets in there, and uh, as you as you say, as you kind of intimate there, it it has shifted over time or whatever. But the building is all, but the palace is always there. The the corridors of power are always there. But Olympus, yeah. Olympus yeah, remains. People, <clears throat> people are just renting yeah. it. Yes. Yeah. But they they believe that they've stayed in it for so long that you know they it, built it. Become, it. They think they yeah built they built it. it yeah. The barbarians, uh, yeah. yeah, they inhabit the ruins and they believe that they're sophisticated. They they were the, the, the sophisticated minds who conjured it up and, you know, they were the artisans that put it together. Um, yeah, it's it's an archetypal vessel, I, I think. This palace that we're speaking of, this Olympus, uh, this this desire, this, this dominating, yes. domineering yeah. force. Um, yes. Yeah. It, it, yeah. I, I was watching that Galahad Eridanus and he brought up a fantastic point and you actually see it within the Sumerian mythologies in fact you see it within a lot of mythologies but uh, Sumeria is, is most pronounced with for example the, the poles of evil so you have the Luciferian and Aramanic poles of evil and in the middle is uh, the, the, the resolution of that which is uh, the Christos right uh, the anointed one, or or merely just the platonic good, the good, right? Um, mm -hmm. Within the Aramanic essence is that dominating spirit that wants to dominate. It wants to re envision nature. Wants to re envision uh, that this this creation uh, that has been uh, founded on the principle, on the first principle, on consciousness, on the initial thought on the pure potential, undifferentiated on God. And then you have the Luciferian essence that seeks to rebel against that, it seeks to instill within uh, these these involuted, um, these spirits involuted within these vessels, it seeks to instill within them uh, un, uh, you know, an unfaithful attitude towards that first principle. And you see that within, so Enki would be, or the Lord of the Earth, would be the sort of Luciferian aspect of that. Enlil, uh, you may describe as the sort of demiurgic aspect of that, the dominating aspect. Um, yeah, it's, it's the same, it's, I mean, it's the same thing. These poles of evil permeate all power. They are the, the, the crux of power. Um, the, the psychological basis of it. I mean, you can call them psychopaths or whatever, but they constantly play themselves out. It's, a, it's an eternal cycle. It just yeah. keeps going. Keeps going. Yes. You, 
you'll never yeah. really stop it. Yeah. But the thing is, what you we ha what we are, we are playing an archetypal role as well within this grand cosmic play. Okay. We are attempting to <laughs> maintain the truth, you know, yeah. which is that yeah. endless horizon that must yes. always be at every point of that circle. Uh, wherever we find ourselves on the circle, you will always find the horizon line uh, at the end. And it's that truth that maintains the momentum of it. So this is the problem. You're never, you can't dominate the circle, if you will. You can't dominate the monad, the monad, monadic center of it, the source of it, um, because then you destroy the circle. Um, you can't, uh, you know, create maximum unfaithfulness to the circle because that will inevitably just feed back into the momentum of it. So you, you get into, it's like what you're saying, Zio, you get into this conundrum. Um, you know, uh, this paradox, I mean, you, you want Um, there, there is nothing. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? So uh, I'm going. Uh, uh, yeah, l uh, I'm let me just to... say something that. Yeah. Uh, well, it will sound controversial, but I will explain. Um, the 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 fact that this problem goes over and over and doesn't have a solution is the simple fact that there is no problem. And what I mean by that is, which is very controversial to, thing to say, what I mean by that is that the, the problem that we see is never meant to be solved in the sense of you have to take out the uh, issue, the issues on the other side so that your side can then, um, you know, prosper and so on and so forth. No, the, 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 the greatest problem is to see, and this is really, really hard, is to see that we are all because they've been where we are and we have been where they were. We, I mean, of course, it's a probably need, not the correct term, of course, but in, a, in an archetypal sense. And so it still kept on and it still went on and it still revolved around the same. Because the, 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 the problem comes from a no problem, comes from a rejection and not an actual opposition. And for example, you were saying and correctly, Silas, about these two sides. And one side has its hero, and the other side has its, uh, its hero, like Christ on one side, Lucifer on the other. For example, just as a, as a, a, a Christian definition, let's say. Just to use a symbology. And Christ and the Antichrist are both Christ. And it's the fact that the negative parts of Christ keep getting rejected and they are rejected. I, my observation is that they are rejected due to the original sin of pride. The, 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 the pride of the self-image where this does not fit. And so if it does not fit, it is rejected and it's removed from its proper place. Because there is a time for, for strength, for example. There is a time for um, even violence. But it has to be in its proper place and time. And if that is rejected, then it goes uh, um, outside of its proper place. It, it, it goes, um, uh, how do you call it, haywire. It just becomes its own um, uncontrolled force until it is actually accepted in its proper position. And this we, we can observe this within ourselves. If you contain, I mean, for example, anger management, right? 
if you treat anger in the sense of controlling it, like, no, no, I'm not going to get angry. No, I'm not going to get angry. No, I'm not going to get angry. One day you'll blow the top and kill everyone in the room. Because it grows and grows and grows the more it is rejected. So well, it becomes the, this. Yeah. I was just going to say, just to, I, I didn't want to finish, uh, cut you off there, but it's similar to what we see with, for example, uh, the celibacy rules within Catholicism. Yes. Yes. If you repress that sexual desire, um, I mean, pretty much the strongest, you know, need or desire, um, especially within men, you it becomes it becomes a shadow form. It becomes, if you will, an antichrist. It becomes that which yes. is a nemesis force against uh, the good, because it's taken out of its proper place. There is a place for sexuality. There is a place for all these energies. There is a proper place and a proper time that are under the guidance of the essential spirit, let's say, right, in a healthy situation. But if it is rejected, it divides further and it becomes um, uncontrollable. And its, its only desire will be to avenge its rejection, to be seen, to be acknowledged as, uh, to have, let's say, it would be the same as Lucifer saying, um, but I have a proper place in heaven, and I was denied it. I have a place among God's angels, and this is, we're talking metaphorically here, right? And I was denied because I, I disagreed with the boss. You know? And since right. then... Of course, that the the opposition becomes stronger and stronger and stronger because it was just growing. The 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 refusal kept growing. And again, um, I am not uh, uh, condoning the other side. What I am going is taking further steps back and realizing the origin of it. Because if we don't yeah. realize the origin, we do not understand that in the bigger um, essential picture, it is not a problem. It is something that is playing out and it will continue to play out until there is, um, uh, um, until it's put in its proper place, until that energy, that force it's, it is put back into its proper place. So Did we say when it finds its resonance? Yeah, it's another way to put it. Sure, we're 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 talking metaphors. Yeah, so yeah, once you once you integrate, reintegrate the the sort of shadow of the self within the larger pleroma or the larger whole that is uh, the sort of tripart tripartite essence of the human, um, you know, in its fundamental sense. So, I mean, you see it throughout mythology, the, the epic of Gilgamesh. I mean, in a contemporary sense, you see it within uh, a fight club, Durden, which is obviously etymologically from uh, the Old English, uh, the Valley of the Beast, right? <laughs> which is obviously an allusion to the Demiurge, uh, or t to the, those, you know, that, that sort of polarity of evil. And obviously the narrator has to, I mean, there's some, the symbolism is rife in that movie, but he has to sort of go into the freezing, um, Hades, uh, Hadesical cave, and uh, he has to, you know, face his fear, overcome the shadow of the self, reintegrate it uh, through, again, you see it within uh, the, the end of Fight Club, he he actually sort of sat, he does what Christ does and sacrifices the self for the better uh, the better parts of the being right um, again all symbolic it's all sim it's it's psychologically symbolic you see the same thing somewhat within the mythology the Irish mythology and Scottish mythology of uh, Finn McCool I believe if I recall correctly. 
and he has a yeah. certain feud with the what was the clan called? Uh, was it Clan Morna or something? Uh, and there's something else to do with his uh, mother, and, and uh, in terms of uh, Morna, how yeah. he was born, and so. yes, yeah, Morna, yeah. So he has a feud with them. There's there's another thing uh, that ties in with the Epic of Gilgamesh, and I forget now. But I mean, literally, the Epic of Gilgamesh is found throughout throughout uh, myth- mythos. Uh, it, very similar as well to Demuzid or Tammuz. The uh, Tammuz, the shepherd, Tammuz, the fisherman, right? It's the same that it's the same idea as uh, again shepherd and the flock through the valley of you know the shadow of the valley of death, um, or the the valley of the the, the shadow of the self, right? Uh, the fisherman would be similar to uh, when Christ states, "I shall make you fishers of men." Again, Pisces is the last, depending on how you view. Uh, the astrological cycle or the zod- zodiacal wheel in its sequence Pisces is the is the final it's the 12th sign it's the si- if you take uh, from Sagittarius the the, the archer um, I believe derives etymologically from the the Greek word Sagitte which means arrow so that links to pestilence um, through the sort of Canaanite tradition and everything a uh, reshef Reshef used his arrow or his spear to thus um, sort of inflict plague upon mankind, it is said. So that's where the pestilence uh, connection comes from. You take that from Sagittarius, you then have four signs up to Pisces, which takes you to the the sort of greenish pale horseman of death, which is Pisces. So Pisces is the lowest point uh, within the subtle bodies concept. It's the lowest point of uh, the feet. Of man, um, obviously Pisces as well is shown as the the, the sort of um, Ouroboros like a uh, rotating uh, koi fish. It can be koi fish or rotating fish. Um, again, the eternal cycle, because after Pisces comes the new dawn of Aries, um, which is I believe a fire sign. So again, you get into that paradoxical uh, element of fire. Which it both is a comforter, and it provides the you know it's the uh, sort of bright, uh, f- uh, flaming essence of the dawn, but it is also that which immolates, eventually immolates the the living being that's born for uh, under you know dawn's light, that's born uh, in the spring. So yeah, you, you have this eternal cycle, um, contained in that. I mean, it's it's found everywhere. I mean. Every religion known to man, I mean, you could take these concepts and simply create a new religion out of them because they're so fundamental, they're so perennial to humanity and it all really ties in to uh, principles of sort of psychology, uh, psycho- psychosocial truths, astrotheological truths, um, seeing man within the stars and by that I mean seeing his very essence his essence of being within the stars, seeing it within the fabric of reality, understanding the environment. And of course, these people have used this in a corrupt way. But to them, I, I believe they they think they're merely sort of, you know, um, putting into effect the cycles. They are, I think they understand they, they are within a play, a, a grander cosmic play, but... I honestly think they they're like they have that demiurgic desire to dominate it. They want to dominate it, um, yes, because they be, they believe falsely they're at the you know the, the apex of the hierarchy. Yes, yes, they do want to dominate it. I I would agree, um, and it happens to, to everyone that sits on that chair. Yeah, go ahead, yeah. Zio. Sorry. No, no, just to concur with what you said, like they they actually have to dominate it. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. because they understand that Silas said previously, the sine wave, like, you know, that you need the energy, the the vibration between the two points of it's it's that fundamental friction between these opposing forces that creates the, the progress. So so they understand that. They they understand that they're in a precarious, you know, cyclical a position within a cycle. So they ha- they are trying their best to 
I think that is the great work to unhook themselves from the cycle and find themselves in a, a, a position of perpetuity. So that is the the act of sorcery that's at hand. So, but but the 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 great game outside of the great work, the great cycle. The question is whether they can break that or not. And uh, it would seem that it's impossible. Perhaps I would agree it's impossible. I would agree it's mm. impossible. But uh, uh, everyone tries. It's it's like that. Um, it's like that scene in. Uh, I don't know if you remember that uh, movie, Minority Report. That space yeah. time Philip K. Dick. Um, Philip K. Yeah, Dick's uh, stories, uh, where. Um, uh, they say, well, but um, maybe this guy won't run. And he says, no, everybody runs. Um, it's, it's inevitable. Everyone in that position runs. And in the same sense, everyone in that chair um, will try the same. Because uh, even, if, even if they consider all the, the other scenarios, the, the alternatives, let's do it differently, let's this, let's that, they eventually always reach that same conclusion that we need to try to do this. And this happens because it is the alternative, the real alternative cannot be even considered, which is the alternative of trying to integrate mm -hmm. the shadow. And that's that's the, the the that's the complicated the narrow road. That is the narrow road. Yeah. And another potential scenario, and Reagan kind of hit hit on this a while ago, when he was talking about the automobile plant, and because of the technology, the technology and the use of computers and the systems, uh, in in the modern you know manufacturing process. Because of the huge focus and absolute reliance on those systems, as Reagan said, there's a lot of people now who are not necessarily trained up to do the roles they're doing, but they, they can sit behind the screen and figure out what way the spreadsheets are going, the, what way the production is going, and suddenly they find themselves in a position of power or management within the organization. So to use that kind of idea, similarly now you have the power structure are you know, increasingly, if not wholly dependent on this machine that they have, uh, this control machine, this algorithm, this wh whatever you, you may call it in all its complexity. So yep. the scenario might be that you have a rival power structure. They mm -hmm. might, might find themselves, because the machine is so evident, and what's to say I can't take it off them? Or what's to say myself and my cronies can't pitch in? Because, yep. you know, power now is no longer, it's no longer about, uh, you know, national borders or your army versus my army or your air force versus my air force. This war, this control mechanism now is happening in a very distinct environment. So what's to stop me okay. and you, you know, so what's to say that in the future you're going to have a kind of a, a civil war or a kind of a antecedent power structure that will try to topple what's there? Because the the reins for the horse, we suddenly see that the horse is no longer galloping wildly around the field. Someone de someone devised a bridle, a set of reins, and a saddle. So we sit, see this uh, leather work on this animal, and we've realised that if we can figure out how to ride the horse, we can jump on there and, and hook ourselves, uh, you know, into the stirrups and hold the reins and guide the horse too. We can. What's the satar square translation? We can guide the the wheel with care. This, we can become mm -hmm. the sower, you know. So, what's to say, you know, that that you may not get a, a rival power structure trying to trying to take over this machine? Um, I'm sure there's there's a heavy competition up there as to who or what or how it's controlled. So, well, um, I I I think as well. Um, I I agree. I agree. I mean, I think all of this when you. When you look at look at just these grander, I don't know, uh, sorts of epochs of human history, right? The grand epochs. I mean, from one point of the historical record to the to the final point of the historical record of a single epoch, um, the Zohar states, for example, 
that human history occurs within six steps. So thus igniting this idea that potentially there may there may have been precursor civilizations that prehistory itself it may may not have been devoid of human uh, civilization or human society or some sort of a uh, hyper organized uh, structure, but that um, each point of human history, because of our own innate psychological drives, the the cycle of the grander epoch. We inevitably end in self-destruction, and these are sort of a uh, self-contained historical epochs. Um, you know, e- each uh, they're compartmentalized. Each one doesn't know of the other's existence. It's a sort of like wiping a uh, clean of the simulation, if you will, right? At the end of these epochs. But if you look at in the grander tapestry of of everything, that is exactly what happens. The the old sort of magician class, if you will, the intellectual class, the priestly class, whatever term we want to use, the, the sort of wizards, right? Um, yeah. They die off. And I think those who have quietly sought knowledge, they eventually sort of, the cream rises to the top, if you will. Um, that they 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 sink to the bottom and the new the new youth rise to the top um i don't know what you know you're you're speaking in archetypes so we're not even speaking about ourselves really i mean it's just a new archetype will take hold um but there's this idea that and it ties into this that uh, that galahad eridanus brought up and it's something i haven't heard in years it's a german word, uh, word it's uh, gestalt so a gestalt is a within psychology. It's it's emphasizing uh, the the sort of uh, the confluence of patterns over um, you know the the composition of its parts, right? So viewing a system is a is a sort of holistic uh, a holistic um, entity, a holistic being, a holistic process. Rather than viewing the smaller processes within that, the smaller components within it that produce that greater process. Um, so in that sense, what we're really seeing is uh, like what Reagan posted in the VC notes. It's the 12 points of the zodiac, but the 12 individual signs of the zodiac, the archetypal essences, the cycles, the, um, the, the sort of smaller uh, eras within that grander epoch, they don't really matter because all that matters is, is that 13th point, right? Um, all that matters is is that grander transition. All that matters is the eschatology, is the end goal. Um, is, is what is, like what you were saying, Armin, what is behind it all? Because the beginning is the end. So what is behi- behind all of this? And if you if you take yourself out of the sort of mass melee of the, these little component parts all working together to create that grander gestalt, right? That grander process of the of this grand epoch of human history that we we reside in, then you begin to find re- that Christ, that Christ resolution, right? You begin to find that middle point. You begin to become a spectator um, that that sees a sort of top-down view of the of, of what's going on, of the tapestry of human history up to this point and even before. And um, yeah, again, that sort of leads us to to this idea that you become inevitably, um, if you chase the the sort of endless horizon of truth, you you inevitably. Um, uh, sort of build that corruption in yourself because I think you become so, disillusioned by it eventually. You, you know, have to go to the, the underworld, like the hero journey. It's, um, it's exactly that. You have to go through the underworld. Yeah. You have to face the shadow world, like Odysseus, right? Um, but, it, it's countless, countless myths speak of the same thing, and it's, it's inevitable, in my view, that you, the hero has to go through um, the underworld, hate
but um, but it has to. There's always a point when it has to go through mm -hmm. the underworld, and it has to be face to face with the things about the hero himself that he doesn't want to see. That uh, because of, of because he's a hero, he's not a villain, right? He doesn't have the uh, you know the 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 traits of the enemy. So if, yes, if I may interject absolutely. for for one, just to just add a greater clarity to to that myth, that sort of reoccurring myth that we see, uh, we see it within the Orphic tradition. I mean, you even see it within uh, that that idea of the fool. Uh, the fool card obviously is the is the zero card, and it's the twenty second or uh, terminal card of the. Obviously, that links back to uh, Prince Yudhisthira. Right, that's uh, essentially it's it's that archetypal story that we see constantly replaying out. Uh, like what you were saying with the the hero, usually now this is this is the thing. And this ties into what we were talking about regarding truth, and you you inevitably inevitably become corrupt, chasing after or lusting after truth, um, because as we see within those stories, the reason typically, apart from Demeter and uh, Persephone within the Eleusinian mysteries. Typically, you find within this myth world, and then does he find his love and then you know leave the underworld right after again, after reintegrating the shadow or facing death or what have you. But the the entire premise, the main source of uh, you know ignition, the the fuel. That, that motivates, encourages the hero into, into death, into facing death, is the pursuit of desire. It's the pursuit uh, of that which he is attached to. It's the pursuit of the endless horizon that he inevitably will never find. Um, you know, because once you go through that process of death, which is the process of knowledge, thus to pursue the endless horizon. When you go into Hades, there's a part of you that dies in there. Uh, ultimately, it has to, for you to enter the, the realm of the dead, the underworld. You, you inevitably leave Hades a broken being, or a bro not a broken being, a broken person. Um, and I think, again, this, this is tying into the sort of psychology of the zodiacal wheel, you have to first break down every individual aspect that makes up you to then, under to then understand really what are you, right? Yep. Um, or what, again, what you are not, at least. Yeah. And what you are not, yes, yes, absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. So it's a sort of negative uh, or yeah. a subtractive uh, growth. Um, but ultimately, the problem stems from you pursue or lust after um, sort of truth, or you know the, you have a desire and attachment to it. Um, it's again, it's the problem that, that that that's the problem with wisdom and ignorance, because if you if you remain ignorant, then you may you then you do not uh, lust after or become attached or desire. Or, or have desire for truth. But if you seek knowledge, if you seek truth, if you seek wisdom, then thus you have to um, at least, you know, uh, 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 pursue one of the three poisons, which is desire or attachment. You, you have to become attached to truth. I mean, you take it, I, of course you have the philosophers who say, you know, um, if, if, truth sh if truth shall kill, then let it kill, or if truth shall kill you, then let it kill you. You know, I believe that was uh, Immanuel Kant. You know, I'm paraphrasing, but it's, it's that idea um, that you'll pursue it, you'll pursue this love into, you know, the underworld. You'll pursue it in everywhere. 
inevitably you'll never reach it because truth is it's infinite and we are but a finite uh, fractal of that infinite um, so that really is the crux of the conundrum at the heart of not just human society but the peculiar and um, really taxing position and condition of uh, human existence itself you know that's what and, leads uh, us to this point yep, sorry. yes and it, it, it comes to uh, to a point after um, at least the realization or, or at least some of the process of death has been realized um, another realization takes its it takes the place of that desire that pursuit which is um the understanding or the uh, um wisdom the wisdom yeah uh of uh realizing that it is uh not a pursuit in the absolutely active sense like the hero would do but an observation as for example and this is just another archetype uh, uh the hermit would do right so um and and therefore now you you were talking about the fool and another part of the journey is the hermit and the hermit is uh, alone observing himself exactly um to build himself up in a more integrated fashion if you like so not as not as naive let's say not as um, um uncontrolled or you know um brash or, or uh, what is the uh, bra brash i think it's the the word yes um, brash, yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, as before and come out of the hermit's cave um with eventually a completely uh, a new persona than before his death let's say than before his his um his pursuit uh, led him there so uh, just to complete and i uh, to complement uh what you were stating there i think Yes, I, I agree. I agree with what you said regarding the hermit. It's yeah, it's it's a very strange thing to ponder. I mean, these myths have they're they're multi layered. I mean, all of them. Um, and see, this is the problem as well. This is just on a really tangential point. It's it's the problem I have with sort of living in a an atheistical society that. For example, I had it uh, very recently on my uh, YouTube comments where somebody stated, um, but you're religious, you, to me, he stated, you're religious, you um, believe in the Tikkun Olam and the Zohar. And I stated, where did I ever state that? <laughs> you know, <laughs> that you can't really speak about any of, I mean, just even in the esoteric sense, you can't speak any, about any of these myths or you become a mason. You can't uh, sort of delve into their value in a, you know, in a sort of psychological sense or even a spiritual sense, or you become, again, um, part of the mystery schools. I had the same thing when I was looking into the mystery of Christ, as it mentions within the New Testament, I believe about 12 times or so, right, if I recall correctly. If you include all the apocryphal texts, the mystery of Christ is is mentioned about maybe sixty or seventy times, um, and the, the Greek term is is pretty uh, consistent. I mean, it's it's it uses mysterion, which is the same Greek word used to you know denote a a mystery school. So it, you you get the same issue, right? That you can't really look into this in a deeper sense. You're either a literalist or um you you know you become uh, or, or or you're atheistical. And if you if you sort of attempt to bridge religion with I don't know, let's call it psychology or science or 
you know, just uh, pursuing a deeper um, truth from these stories, then you sort of, uh, I don't know, uh, a, a mason, a religious whack job, or a, a, a pursuer of the mystery schools. Um, yeah. Sorry, I went on a, a tangent there, but I, I agree with everything you said, Armin, regarding uh, uh, the, the hermit um, archetype. Um, I mean, the entire... I have a, a graphic somewhere, the entire tarot deck, it, it, it lays out the source of, again, that death and resurrection ritual that occurs. All I mean, the, the moon, all the moon, yes. Yeah, all times, yeah. I mean, the moon card is a, another example where you see a uh, Canis Major and kind of Canis Minor uh, mixed with the oh, well, uh, it's the Winter Triangle. Obviously, you have this sort of yellow road uh, leading to the mountain, um, which is obviously Capricorn, right? That that idea that uh, the 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 seahorse or the sea goat can it can exist its bottom half can exist. Um, simultaneously within the, the 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 ocean the abyss and obviously the top half can exist within uh, you know it can climb any mountain can climb any vertical um uh, face so again one it, it can simultaneously exist and it complements each other both within within the underworld or the abyss the abzu and also within uh, the sort of heavenly realm um so that's, again, you become a balanced individual then, once you go through the winter, right? Which is, the, that zodiacal season. That is obviously uh, sort of directly facing the lobster, which is emerging from the ocean on the moon card, which is, uh, or, or the, I mean, it can be the crayfish, which essentially is a uh, cancer, right? So they, those two, cancer is obviously the gateway of the underworld to the you know the Babylonians and the Akkadians and the Sumerians it's the zenith of life but if you understand life to be uh, a sort of underworld to heaven um, you know to the perspective of heaven then you sort of understand why it could be uh, it could be stated or argued to be the, the gateway to the underworld um, so that's obviously directly north to that uh, yeah, obviously, uh, Sirius and Canis, uh, my, Canis Minor and Canis Major. Canis Minor obviously contains Sirius. That, uh, for the longest time throughout every tr tradition, that has been held as, uh, you see it within the Fool card as well, it's sort of held as a, I don't know, a, what would you call it? A sort of guiding astronomical, astronomical or celestial body. Um, it's very, it's very closely linked to enlightenment and, and all of these principles, uh, Sirius is. I mean, you can see that going all the way back to Gobekli Tepe. There's a place just outside of Gobekli Tepe, uh, I believe due east. So that whole area was a metropolis at one point. 100,000 people existed there, if you believe the data, in 17,000 BC. So that if we're talking about human history is within 6,000 year periods, then that was, what, two cycles ago? And they have star maps there that show the same uh, sort of, uh, you know, seasonal quadrant structure. Um, and east, due east is Karen Tepe. That, was, that, that entire complex was a, a, a temple dedicated to Sirius, the star Sirius. Um, I mean, it's... These these things are, are are pretty ancient. I mean, the the I don't know who who came up with this truth. Has it always existed? Who knows? Is the date an incorrect? I mean, that's a potential as well. But and what we get is a fractal of it <laughs> already already yeah. gone through so many yeah. times on the blender, yeah. right? So uh, just yeah. one thing that I would like to um, address regarding the uh, oh zeal left. I hope it wasn't anything I said. Um, no, it's probably just it's quite late here. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm um, on as well. I do apologize. Yeah. Um, which was about the the moon card. Couldn't couldn't the lobster be Scorpio instead? It would make perhaps more sense. It could be Scorpio. Yeah, Scorpio. 
again, the, the way I look at it is um, I think it's so if you were to pull up the zodiacal wheel, which I'm going to do right now because I've totally um, and you pull up the moon card you see obviously there's a direct there's a straight line between uh, there's a straight line between Capricorn and Cancer which you see with yeah. you know with that um, it's sort of south to, yeah. south to north yeah it's the opposition yeah. um, it could be Scorpio yes I mean Scorpio is, is the uh, the sign of death um, I believe it's also I mean if you look at a lot of the wars they actually occur within uh, the, the sign of Scorpio oh, okay. I mean uh, the October Revolution is a prime example of that they didn't storm the Winter Palace until the sign of Scorpio, they had entered the sign of Scorpio um, so yeah, it, I mean it could it could be Scorpio, absolutely um, I, I know Cancer was for quite a long time it was considered as a crayfish, not as a crab. Uh, it was, I believe, it was the Greeks that changed it to uh, karkinos, which is their term for crab. Uh, it's the Greek word for crab. But I believe in the the Babylonian period, and uh, obviously previously, but we can imagine uh, it was a crayfish. If I'm correct, I think it was. There was another thing as well, another animal that they used, but it was. Uh, I believe it was a, a, a crayfish, yeah, that was mainly used. Funnily enough, Scorpio is, I mean, that's, that hasn't changed, to, to my knowledge. I mean, if you look at Gobekli Tepe, you actually, there's a star map there. Uh, one of the quadrants is Scorpio, so, I mean, what you state there may be correct. Um, and it, it hasn't changed. It's always been a scorpion. I don't know why. I mean, it's just that has not changed one iota. Um, no, and I'm not. I'm not saying that it is. I'm just um, wondering because, yeah. well, I didn't know. I didn't actually know about that change in the cancer symbology um, that it changed from a crayfish to um, to a crab. So that would make sense too. But um, it's just looking at a lobster. It's much more similar. To yeah. a scorpion. Uh, well, it's not a lobster, but like you say, right. um, a crayfish um, is much more similar to a scorpion than to uh, to um, a crab. But um, but if it was changed in the past, and then, then that makes sense. Yes. And I was just wondering. Of course, um, we we don't know. Oh no, we. I mean, it, as as well, Scorpio is actually extremely. I mean, it's very, um, it's very important. In fact, you see Scorpio a lot on a lot of the. I mean, it's very prominent within a lot of uh, the esoteric illustrations and such. Um, I mean, I, I still, I, I don't really know why, but it seems to be very important. I mean, um, I mean, it, it would be if you looked at the. Let me get up the zodiacal wheel again. Sorry, guys, we're probably being very boring here. Um, yeah, I mean, there's obviously different ways of of looking at the zodiacal wheel. Obviously, when you um, you look at the fixed signs, you look at the the fixed signs, the cardinal di uh, directions or signs, and there's another. I forget the other. Uh, one, but each of them obviously because there's twelve, you can they they divide into four uh, separate crosses, right? So of course one is from Aries to Cancer to Ca uh, to Libra to Capricorn, and then you have one that goes from uh, Taurus to uh, Virgo to Scorpio to um, Pisces. Then you have one Gemini Aquarius uh, Leo. I believe in uh, Sagittarius. Um, I mean, in English now, but it's essentially the 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 royal stars of Persia. Um, that also sort of creates a sort of a a tav, a cross, right, uh, an X uh, shape. 
and I believe Scorpio is contained within within that within that sort of a uh, cross shape uh, of the four royal stars of you know Persia. I don't actually know. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, man. Yeah, but but Scorpio is actually a key point because yeah, um, it's the passage to to the thirteenth sign as well uh, of Ucus, right? So, oh um, yes, yeah. It's the entrance to the underworld, to that underworld that we were talking about, that the hero has to go through, and the Ophiuchus is the hero battling with him, with himself, right? So. <clears throat> Yeah, so Scorpio well, it, is the doorway in that sense. Well, it's it's uh, in the M shape as well, is it not? The 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 sign. So yeah. of course M is the the third. Which essentially is sort of the statistical uh bottleneck effect or the statistical uh projection of death, right? Um or of, of the harvest. Is, is another way of describing it. I believe it's uh, the eighth sign too, is it not? So you have that idea yeah. of the eight, um, yeah. the solar analemma, the, it's the water. Yes, it is water. Yes, it's, so it's it's a mutable characteristic element. Um, as as well, you of course the eight is the taijiti or the the dividing of the circle. Um, I mean, which itself is. Pretty, pretty damn important. I mean, it's it's that idea of the self or the Y principle, the single branch bifurcating into the two, uh, the two lines. So yeah, it's, it's ultimately it's the same thing we've been talking about throughout this entire discussion. But yeah, yeah, absolutely, I agree. You guys, are you uh, bored to death? Did you fall asleep already? <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> Yep. I think they did yep. fall asleep. Yeah. They've they've fallen asleep. <laughs> Gladly they yeah. were muted, otherwise we would hear the snoring. I mean, all all of the signs, everything you see throughout that zodiacal wheel. Now don't get me wrong. Holistically they're all important, but what there's there's certain signs that are more important than the others. Um so I mean, between Aries and Cancer, what you find within Taurus and Gemini are are simply like um, what would you call it? Like uh, milestones of progression between the two seasons. Um, again, it's the same between Cancer and Libra. You find Leo and Virgo. Um, again, those are milestones of progression, right? Progression to to Libra. Then from or the autumnal equinox, and then from Libra to Capricorn. I mean, yes, they're they're all important, but um, I mean, the way I look at, it, just because you know it's easier for me to to sort of uh, figure out. <laughs> um, yeah. I look at I look at the seasonal. Uh, so I look at you know the, the the main cross, if you will, well the you know from Aries to Cancer, to Libra to Capricorn, um. And I sort of uh, affix the north point to Aries, then to, you know, obviously Cancer would be west, Capricorn would be east, and uh, Libra would be south. And we see that same thing within, for example, the uh, masonry, that idea of, um, God, I forget, I forget the uh, phrase now. Uh, I'm, I'm a traveller uh, coming from oh, the west. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. seeking that which mm -hmm. was lost. No, I'm a traveller from the east, um, heading west, seeking that which was lost. Yes. So in essence, what, what we're discussing here within terms of, for example, the moon card, right, let's take that, is mm -hmm. you go through, you go from Capricorn, which is the, the, the higher evolution of the spirit, right? It's that heavenly essence. Then you, you become involuted, right? You, bec you descend, you fall from heaven down to the gateway of the underworld, which is cancer, right? The, the can uh, cancer, the carquinos, the crab, the lobster, the crayfish, the, 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 you know, the, the shellfish, if you will, right? Essentially, 
remember uh, crabs, crayfish, lobsters. Essentially, what they are is they they crawl on their they have I believe six legs. Again, that links with uh, the natural world world of carbon. Again, carbon coming from the Latin charcoal or that which is the product of fire, and um, they they sort of crawl around in their their bellies almost right. They I, they they can exist within the water and out with the water, but not far far in land, right? Only on the beach, um, which is the sort of ground down uh, essence, you know, of the rock, right? Um, again, the fractals of the rock in in many ways, so they can exist there. They're sort of sort of bottom feeders as well, right? I mean, yeah. the, the the grime uh, that's on the beach, and of course, that's near the shoreline. Um, so again, it's all this is all metaphor, but yeah, that's an, I guess in, in essence as well. You have the the six and nine uh, fused together, which is I believe the sign of cancer. Yes, yes. So yeah, you you see this, uh, you see the the sort of what's going on here. You know, it's. Uh, that idea of young spiritual evol- uh, evolution leading to conscious evolution, or from, or you involute to cancer, which is in the west, right? You travel westwards because you're seeking that which is lost, which is the shadow, right? So you go yes. into the underworld, the gateway of the underworld. Um, of course, I believe cancer is linked to the moon. Yes, it's a sign under yes, the moon. Yeah. So the moon is obviously in the Bhava Chakra. That is the gateway to oblivion. That is uh, how you're born into the world, the gateway of the underworld, which is the vaginal canal, the mother's womb. You go into this uh, world of green unripeness, of the colour of death, and you then have to sort of, you know, go eastward, which is the new dawn uh, in Capricorn, right? Um, it's that idea. Yes. Or you can see it within Aries and Libra, which is the same idea, right? You go from um, sort of Libra, which is a similar idea to Cancer, and you go to Aries, which is the new dawn and all of this. Um, I believe Libra is the Omega. Yeah, it's the, is, is it not the sign? I believe it is a sign. It, it, it's sign is the Omega, I believe, with a line underneath it. Yeah, it is. So you go from the Omega Pond, which you see within the Star Tarot card. She scoops it up from the Omega Pond, this water of life, and she pours it on the the, the Earth, right? And then yeah. obviously it trickles back to to the Omega Pond eventually, and then the cycle continues. You know, uh, around and around we go, the wheel, uh, the wheel of Yama or whatever. You know, it's, it's these ideas, really, that it's, uh, the entire esoteric corpus is hinting at. Um, that that you were describing mind. reminded me of the, uh, of the hymn of the pearl included in the Acts of Thomas, that agnostic text. Are you familiar yeah. with it? You know? Yeah, I, I have. Yeah. I have come across that. I haven't actually read that, but I've seen it and um, I, I listened to a lot of... Um, uh, well, I have been recently listening to a lot of Gnostic uh, YouTube channels, so they they have discussed that. Um, I, ca- I can't recall it, you know, it totally, um, you know, uh, off the top of my head now. But put it yeah. on on the show no- on the uh, voice notes here for anyone um, when the guys um, wake up <laughs> if they're interested. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That is one of the uh, most um, incredible um, esoteric texts ever. This this hymn of the pearl. Mm-hmm. It's it's so in in. In what normally is a, in what comparatively, I mean, is a concise manner, uh, and I'm just talking about the hymn itself, not the Acts of Thomas, um, it, 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 
expounds so much um, just by itself. It's incredible. All the symbology there of uh, uh, him being uh, the heir to the, tr to the throne and deciding to go down to Egypt mm -hmm. and Egypt would be the material world. Uh, and then he yeah. gets lost there and he, and he forgets that he's the son of the king. I mean, there's, it, the, if anyone is, is really interested in, in this kind of thing, it's really a must read. When I was a little child and dwelling in my kingdom, uh, in my kingdom of my father's house, and in the riches and luxuries of my teachers, I was living at ease. Now, again, you see that with um, uh, Siddhartha, uh, what, yeah. oh, what, uh, the Buddha. Uh, yeah, yeah. Before he became the Buddha, uh, what was his name? Siddhar Siddhartha. Siddhartha Gautama. Gautama. Yeah, Gautama. Yeah, Gautama. It's the same idea, right? Where he wasn't, he was innocent. He wasn't uh, surrounded by death. His father would not uh, subject him to to the essence of death, only to life and to new life and to the dawn. But the problem is. Anything that um, uh, you know, any anything that exists or no, it doesn't it doesn't exist, but dwells within being, right? It dwells within being. It has the essence of being. It will always inevitably and again ask that question: Who am I? So ultimately, the the, the that's the pr the problem is contained within the question. Because the answer that we receive is very painful because, again, life is the pleasant lie, death is the painful truth, right? Yeah. So when you go into death, you, you're, you inevitably go on that sort of, uh, again, you chase that horizon that you will never reach because you're on, uh, you know, it's, it's the circle, right? It's the wheel. You're constantly chasing, you're constantly moving that wheel round and round, attempting to find the answer of who am I, without actually understanding where you are on the wheel, and that the wheel itself, uh, the, the question itself, is, uh, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's not an illusion, but it's a... Um, what would the word be? It's uh, sort of dichotomous. It's uh, it's incorrect. It's a it's a fallacy to begin with, right? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, yeah. In, in a sense, I understand what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So you you are if you are the the essence of the infinite, then it's not the question isn't is an um who am I, right? It's what you know who will I be. Right or what will I be? Um, because inevitably you get lost again. This is probably where reincarnation came from. This idea, you inevitably get lost in the various personas, the various uh, forms that you can take, right? Um, the, and then and inevitably, <laughs> the problem is people become narcissistic and get attached to these forms or, or these personas. Um, I mean, even people that believe that they've killed the ego, inevitably they get locked into the ego because they believe they're better than everyone else. They believe they've yeah. achieved a sort of higher, more pious status compared to everyone else, right? Um, yeah. Which itself, again, you, you get sort of bogged down in illusions um, without understanding the, the entire question itself has borne all of these illusions. Um, but yeah, and then it goes, then from our home in the east, after they had made preparations, my, fa my parents sent me forth. And then they made with me an agreement. Again, uh, then from our home in the east, I went into oblivion after they had made preparations. After that, I had, you know, been uh, uh, drunk from the river Lethe, with, from the Orphic tradition, had forgotten, had went into amnesia. And had been involuted into this uh, sort of um, vessel, my parents sent me forth. So from Aries, from birth, or from cancer, right? From the birth, you then go round the cycle, right? 
Then they made with me an agreement and they inscribed it in my heart so that it would not be forgotten. So it's that idea of the only way you're going to find who you are or what you are, where you came from rather, it is contained within the heart. What is the heart? Within Kabbalah, it's the Tiferet, right? But that exists within every single esoteric mystery school. The heart is that which connects the body and the mind. It's which maintains both of them, right? In a constant, a, in a sort of constant a cycle of blood. Blood in, blood out, right? And how does it do that? It does that through mul multiple uh, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of uh, contractions, then explosions, right? Contractions inward, then um, sort of explosions outward. Um, again, that, that's how this entire world came to be. How It's how it still uh, is, right? It's how all of the epochs pan out. It's mass contractions that create explosions of new life. The contraction of death, the explosion of new life. Um, so the heart essentially is is the middle organ. It's the it's that balancing point. Yeah, if you would go down into Egypt, Death Egypt the cross, yeah, and bring back the one pearl, yeah, yeah, the the monad, the mm -hmm. the actual essence, the the white innocent uh, essence of the keter, or the crown, or the again that that sort of uh, the consciousness, right? Yeah. Understanding who you are which is in the middle of the sea. So again, the sea is that idea of the tempest. You have all of these ideas of the Leviathan, um, which from the Hebraic etymology, I believe, I put it in one of my books that I'm probably going to release soon on Bowie's Black Star, yeah. A Leviathan derives from a, a Hebraic etymology, meaning a garland of chaos, I believe. A garland or a wreath of chaos, right? Again, the Ouroboros, right? The idea of the Ouroboros. Um, so, which is in the middle of the sea. Yeah, the sea is the abyss or the abzu. can also be... Uh, I, do, I believe the sea is the abzu or the abyss, is it? Or is that the inland rivers? But it could be the, the deep, which is the Tiamat. I mean, that is the essence of chaos in the grander sense, so that's probably what they're, what he's getting at there. So the middle of the chaos, um, surrounded by the hissing serpent. Um, interesting, you could, you could look at that, so of course within, you see the anterior view of the spine and the brain, that's a serpent, but you can also see that as yeah, the demiurge, of course, because he's not, uh, who wrote this? Bardesian from Edessa. So a Syriac Gnostic. So because, again, the, the, the Gnostic idea of the hissing serpent would be uh, the loose, again, it, I don't know if it would be the Demiurge. The Dem no, it the Demiurge. is the Demiurge, yes, yes. Yes, it yes. becomes evident, yes. That uh, because he charms right. the serpent uh, by speaking his father's name uh, later on in the poem. Um, mm. which is done very, very quickly, and it's just a verse. He just says, I basically charmed the serpent by speaking my father's name, and that's it. So all the right. journey was uh, for this quick realization, for this quick uh, moment of, um, you know, you would expect that this confrontation with the serpent would be a, you know, the, these many stanzas and given this much importance, no, no. He basically uh, puts the serpent to sleep by charming it, by speaking it, uh, the, his father's name, and takes the pearl and that's it. And then the rest is dedicated not only to his descent, but then to his ascent back to yeah. the, the father's kingdom. It's given much, much more important. The, the, the defeat, let's say, of the serpent and the taking of the pearl is a verse. So. The, the, the reason I brought up, it, it may not be the Demiurge. Now, it probably, I, I mean, it probably is, but it's because when you see the Demiurge with the Gnostic art, it shows that polarity. Actually, funnily enough, it shows that polarity of evil. 
that you find within Rudolf Steiner's work of the uh, of the sort of the lower body is the serpent and the higher essence is the lion, right? With obviously the the sort of atom uh, disc, the the sun, the solar disc radiating out. Um, again, that speaks to this idea that the demiurgic head is is this thing that believes it is God. It believes it is the one. It's a jealous, covetous force. Um, and of course, that that would be more in, in claim, It was. It'd be more in in relation to to Araman, which is. Uh, I mean, it's very. It is they, they're they're essentially they is they're archetypes of the demiurge. I would see it as, but Rudolf Steiner seems to make a distinction, um, and a lot of the esoteric does. But yeah, but I will you, agree. You make a good point. You make a good mm -hmm. point. I I always read this poem uh, with the image of the serpent as being the the demiurge. Um, mm. But um, you you do have a point. There is a distinction, yes, because uh, just a serpent may not be uh, the demiurge. If it was the serpent with the head of a lion, um, then that would for sure, yeah, yeah. So it yeah, would be a chimera. It... He would he would face a chimera, uh, right? Chimera, um, in that sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think yeah, I think you're right. Yes, instead of the monolith of the the serpent, so you the chimera itself is, uh, it is the essence of the demiurge because the demiurge is a god of time. It's a god of thresholds, um, you know, a god of uh, the beginning and the end. Um, but interestingly, as well, I mean, uh, then you will put on your glorious garment, uh, your toga, uh, which rests is laid over it. And with your brother, our second in command, you will be heir in our kingdom. That's very interesting. And with your brother, our second in command, you will be heir in our kingdom. It's twin. <laughs> Pardon? It's his twin. I think that's yeah. the symbology there. Yeah, the see, twin see, side of him. Yeah. See, this is the thing. See, th this is getting to this this notion of the de of the demiurge, right? It, See, this, the hissing serpent is merely, merely the, the sort of Lucifer, Luciferian aspect of it. So it's that idea of the mental aspect um, leading down to the body, right? The, the sort of nervous system, all of that, um, the spinal column. But what he, is, what he has become in this world is the demiurge, right? Um, like Yama, he, which means twin. Um, he has become the root of David, the root of the duad, uh, which, of course, the square root of uh, two is 1.414, right? So, again, you see this idea of, like, Atten, it has 14 rays. Um, the, Abraxas, as well, uh, adds, uh, I believe, in um, Greek isoph isophysy, which is essentially Greek gematria. That adds up to 365. Again, there's 365 days of the year, um, give or take. That is then a, a sort of the, 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 the root uh, numerator of that is, or divisor rather, is um, a seven. So again, this is why seven is associated with the Demiurge as well. It's a, it's a god of time. But that idea of uh, and with your brother, our second in command, you will be heir in our kingdom. But uh, we've hmm. read that part as his twin, in the yeah, sense of the other, the other side of him, I you know, agree, the yeah. other, the other him, let's say. But that that was always my reading. It's not um, necessarily the intent. Well, no, my 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 reading would agree with yours. I'm just hmm. looking at it from a. The sort of side that he's, but you know, he's that he has that demiurgic as aspect, right? right. Um, that meant that I, I mean, oh, you no, you're right. He it. goes, he goes down to Egypt, to Egypt to fetch the pearl. Yeah, but in fact, it's not to fetch the pearl. That's why so little importance is given in the text to the actual collection of the pearl. It's a passage of of one two verses at most, because he he actually went there. To fetch himself, to 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 answer like we've always said the the, the question of who am I, 
so that when he returned, he would be able to take the throne and, and get his inheritance, let's say. So he could finally realize, now that he knows, he can finally realize with his twin brother, I would say, um, although twin is not in the text, but at least that's my reading, with his two, twin brother, he would be able to rule the kingdom, right? So, yeah, yeah. So yeah, very little importance is given to well actually and, collecting. Yeah. Yeah. It, well, essentially, it's, it's like the Capricorn. So the lower essence is balanced with the higher essence. It's not that one essence wins out against the other. It's um, you, you have constant balance between the, the, the sort of bifurcated elements, which is the body and the mind. And you understand the one peril, which is that which binds both of them. So again, it's like the Y principle, or the Y shape. You know, I went straight... You're breaking up. Oh, sorry. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, go, I went straight to the serpent. So it's that idea that he, um, he goes straight to the sort of mental aspect, knowledge, all of that. Around its lodging, I settled until it was going to slumber and sleep. As I may sna might snatch my peril from it, yes. Then I became single and alone, which is similar to the how the Gnostics describe, I believe, the, the monad, which is the, oh, the bythos and the sigi. So sigi is silence, and uh, I believe bythos is depth. Profundity, profundity, I believe. Um, there's also another um, aspect of the monad, and I forget the Greek for it, but it, is, it does, it's, it's that idea of, a, you know, loneliness or alone. Not loneliness, but alone. Um, yep. mm -hmm. To my fellow lodgers, I became a stranger. So to everyone else, you know, I, I couldn't, I could no, you can, you can no longer, uh, you know, fraternize, yeah. relate exactly yeah. with people. But in some way or another, they perceived that I was not of their country. Absolutely. So they ming so you're you, you're alive within the, the land of the dead, if you will. So, um, so they mingled their deceit with me, and they made me eat their food. So they sort of um, they made him uh, eat or feast from the the table of lies. Yeah. I forgot that I was, a, I was a son of kings and I served their king. So I forgot that I was not of this world and I served this world and I forgot the peril or that consciousness, that higher essence, that fractal essence of the first principle on account of which my parents had sent me. Because of the burden of their exhortations, I fell into a deep sleep or their motivations, their encouragements. So I fell into, again, a deep sleep, a slumber. But interestingly, you see the, the serpent as well slumbers and sleeps. So it's that idea that at any point it can wake up. So you, you see this idea of the cycles contained in that too, that imagery, that when you sleep, you die, of course. This is the understanding of the imagery of, the, of, of sleep. Um, and death is almost yeah. like a mini-sleep itself. But the sun, it's linked to the celestial, the clockwork celestial movements of the sun and the moon. So it's that constant eternal Piscean cycle, or or Ouroboros, right? Uh, and obviously that's reflected within the microcosm as well. Um, yep. But because the serpent of, these... the serpent of, uh, of Ragnarok is sleeping until the I time know. of Ragnarok when. Uh, it battles with Thor, and they both kill, kill each other. And remember that Thor is bitten by the serpent. Um, he is poisoned, and he takes seven steps, and then he dies. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Seven steps, then he dies. And of course, yeah. as well, right at the beginning, you have the Trinity uh, that creates the, the world through uh, the betrayal of Ymir. And uh, I believe uh, also um, oh, Alfumbla, or the, the celestial cow, the cosmic cow that uh, uh, nursed Ymir. 
So, oh, who who was a uh, Odin, Vili, and Ve, who were born, I believe, of of Ymir, um, and they slew their father, and established the world. Uh, these three brothers. Funnily enough, you see within the 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 two prime, the only two reverse primes that we know of are thirty seven and seventy three. Which you times them together gets you get a uh, two thousand seven hundred and one, which is obviously the the Hebrew gematria value, because obviously Hebrew the Hebrew alphabet also uh, represents numerals. That is the the value of um, a Genesis one one. So, I mean, you see it contained everywhere that the Trinity turns. The, the trinity that establishes the world, or in our our case, the spirit, the mind, and the body. You see that within the dark side of the moon, um, when the, 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 the white light, singular white light, hits the prism, um, or the mind, it then refracts into the entire world, you know, the, the sort of fractured, separated essence of the soul, or the archetypes, the world of forms, um, so yeah, you 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 essentially see the same thing, just contained within that thirty-seven. Um, of course, as well. Funnily enough, uh, if you add together the value of the Sun Tarot card, which is nineteen, and you add that with the Moon Tarot card, which is eighteen, right? You obviously get thirty-seven. <laughs> so you see that with obviously the the Rebus too. You funnily enough, you see that with the Demiurge. You see the su- the crescent of the moon, and uh, the six points of the the sun. And obviously, the Demiurge is the central point, which is the the re- which seemingly is the resolution between the two uh, polarities, right? Um, again, it's getting to this idea that we are the Demiurge, that we are the polarity. Uh, of evil, right? And we, the only way we're going to find that uh, that essence that's behind us, the halo, if you will, right. is we, we have to sort of, um, uh, you know, go through this land of the dead and understand that we are actually alive. There's a part of us that, that is not of the land of the dead. There's a part of us that is um, of, of something greater, of something more vital, you know? Um. So, so I was just uh, uh, an aside. <clears throat> I don't know if you can do. Um, a friend of mine is trying to join the conversation, but can't see the talk room. Uh, oh, would you right. be able? Hold on. Um, it's because. Hold it's on, I'll large. change the permissions. What, what's uh, what's his name? Uh, Lucy Tana. It's a her. It's a she. But. Uh, All right. Yeah. Uh, Lucy Tana. Yes. 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 Right. I've added her, so she probably can. She can see it now, most likely. Okay, I'll ask. But go on. Sorry. No, sorry. I'm rambling. I could go on for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours about circles. this. Circles, 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 yeah. and circles. Yeah. From oh, your father, the King of Kings, and your mother, the Governor of the East. Again, it's the same idea. From your yeah. brother, our second in command. Right, so look at that. So you're right. So you see uh, way down, um, blah, 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 blah. From your father, the king of kings, right, we're getting into the trinity here. This is the spirit or the fractal essence of the first principle. And your mother, the governor of the east, the, the moon, right? Um, the, the gateway of the underworld within the moon tarot card. And from your brother, our second in command, again, you can see that it's Capricorn, perhaps, the Yama. He who, um, I don't know, is the sort of psychopomp essence, the, the ferryman, the lord of the dead, the lord of this world, right? Um, that which you, you're, seeing, you're seeing just in that, the father, the mother, and the brother, uh, you're seeing that tripartite essence. So you are son who is in Egypt, peace. Awake and arise from your sleep, and hear the words of our letter. Uh, again, hear the words of the Avra Kadavra, that that which created the four worlds, created the box, 
Uh, remember that you are a son of kings. Consider the slavery you are serving. Remember the peril um, on account of which you were sent to Egypt. Think of your glorious garment. Remember your splendid toga, uh, again awake from your amnesia, which you will put on and wear when your name is called out from the book of uh, the combatants or the athletes. And with your brother, our viceroy, with him, you will be in our kingdom. So again, it's, it's, it's not that the peril becomes you. It's not that even you go through pure enlightenment. You become, you, you learn to live in balance with the various volatile parts of oneself. You take on that 13th point, uh, that point of unification. Yeah. Which is obviously the, the letter M, which you see at the end of Fight Club, the Divine Union, through, again, uh, the third, well, the 13th tarot card is, is the death card. So, yeah. De death actually is, is, is uh, so, sort of metaphorically the pathway to life in, in that sense. Again, metaphorically. Uh, uh, an M is the symbolic representation of a valley. It's two mountains put together, two inverted V's. Bingo. Bingo. Other stuff there. And it is That's the, the most important letter part. of the 26. You know, it's all about the middle. The middle ah, starts right. with M. It's the median. The uh, uh, you know, How many words could you go with M and middle, you know, center? center path, middle alignment, etc, etc. Interestingly, a lot of people say it as well when they have nothing else to say. I, I guess I still say it a lot. You say, um, um, <laughs> when, when your mind has sort of died for a split yeah. second, you fell asleep. You've got nothing else to say. You're at the terminal point. You go, um, it's just, it's just interesting that you see it throughout. I mean, it's cross-cultural. It's cross-linguistic. You see it in many languages. Um... But so from then on, he, he remembers um, mm -hmm. who he is. Um, and note what, what happens next. And note how quick and how um, even unimportant um, the the taking of the pearl becomes mm. because it's really it's really just a little passage. It says, "Okay, I've I've picked up the I've put the serpent to sleep. I picked up the pearl, and then the rest is far more important to the writer of this mm. poem than actually taking the uh, the pearl." Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, I, I. What then? You know. Right. Yeah, and then he says yeah. that, uh, and there and thereon I snatched up the pearl and turned to the house of my father. Their filthy and unclean garments I stripped off and left in their country. To the way that I came, I betook me to the light of our home, to the dawn land. On the road, on the road, I found there before me my letter that had aroused me, as with its voice it had roused me. So now with its light, it did lead me. On fabric of silk in letter of red, with shining appearance before me, encouraging me with its guidance, with its love, it was drawing me onward. I went forth, through Sarbag, Sarbag I passed, I left Babel, Babel land on my left hand, and I reached on to Maishan the Great, the meeting place of the merchants that lieth hard by the seashore. Right? My glorious... Um, <clears throat> My glorious robe that I had stripped off and my mantle with which it was covered, down from the heights of Hir Hircania, thither my parents did send me, by the hands of their treasure dispensers who trustworthy were with it trusted. Without my recalling its fashion, in the house of my father my childhood had left it. At once, as soon as I saw it, the glory looked like my own self. So he saw who he was he remembered right mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. 
And when he saw that, so I saw it all, in all of me and saw me all, in all of it. So he was the, 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 the glory. Uh, that we were twain in distinction and yet again one in one likeness. I saw to the treasures also who unto me had down brought it. Were twain and yet of one likeness. For one sign of the king was upon them. Who through them restored me to glory, the pledge of my kingship. The glorious robe all bespangled with sparkling splendor of colors, with gold and also with barrels, chalcedonies, iris hued, with sards of varying colors to match its grandeur. Moreover, it had been completed with adamantine jewels. All of its seams were off fastened. Moreover, the King of Kings image was depicted entirely all over it. And as with sapphires above, was it wrought in a motley of color. I saw that moreover all over it the motions of gnosis abounding. I saw it further was making ready as though for to speak. I heard the sound of its music, which it whispered as it descended. Behold him, the active in deeds, for whom I was reared with my father. I too have felt in myself how that with his works wa waxed my stature. And now with his kingly motions was it pouring itself out towards me, and made haste in the hands of its givers, that I might take and receive it. And me too, my love urged forward to run to meet it, to take it. And I stretched myself forth to receive it, with its beauty of color I decked me, and my mantle of sparking colors I wrapped entirely all over me. I clothed me therewith, and ascended to the gate of greeting and homage. I bowed my head and did homage to the glory of him who had sent it whose commands I now had accomplished, and who had to done what he'd promised. And there at the gate of his house sons, I mingled myself with his princes, for he had received me with his gladness, and I was with him in his kingdom, to whom the whole of his servants with sweet-sounding voices sing praises. He had promised that with him to the court of the kings of kings I should speed, and taking with me my pearl, should mm -hmm. with him be seen by our king. The hymn, well, then it's a, a signature. The hymn of Judas, the uh, Thomas the Apostle, which he spoke in prison, is ended. It will, so, on, yeah. Oh, no, so, sorry. Sorry, go. go, go no, go, no, no, go ahead. No. I was going to say, I clothed uh, me therewith and descended to the gates of greetings and homage. I bowed my head and did homage to the glory of him who had sent it, whose commands I now had accomplished, and who had two done what he'd promised. Uh, so this is the most important part. And, the, and because it really clues you into what he's speaking about. And there at the gate of his house sons, I mingled myself with his princes. Right? So again, it's getting to that idea of the f what we see on the zodiacal wheel, which is, you know, in the 13th hidden uh, zodiacal point or zodiacal sign, the Ophiacus. The serpent bearer. It's that which all other signs emanate out from, right? You can think of it as I don't know the the source of it is as Bowie puts it in Black Star, right? It's that uh, black sun, black hole. It's the pure infinitude of absolutely everything that could ever be and nothing all at the same time. Um, it is, you know, pure potential, undifferentiated, unmanifested, that idea. Um, and the only way to comprehend that is obviously through um, the void uh, with the keter or the crown of, uh, of orange or, or white which surrounds it. It's the only way to understand what truly God is, right? Um, so again, there at the, the gate of his house sons, I mingled myself with his princes, meaning that he merged all of the available archetypal essences. He understood what they were in the grander, again, that, that term gestalt, in the grander um, pattern of the whole, rather than just the summation of its parts. Right, he understood holistically, 
rather than just um, in a sort of fractured or fragmented sense, right? And um, and it continues, for he had received with uh, received me with gladness the thirteenth thirteenth sign or the Ophiacus again the Christ who was the thirteenth among amongst his twelve disciples, for he had received me. Uh, I, was, uh, I was with him in his kingdom. Uh, to whom the whole of his servants with sweet sound and voices sing praises. He had promised uh, that with him to the court of the king, king of kings, I should speed and take him with me my peril, or, you know, my, my uh, fractal essence of that greater, uh, greater divine. I mean, the peril as well is, is grown within the mouth of the oyster, within the abyss itself. It is sort of forged, moulded um, within deep, a deep darkness of that uh, oystered cave, right? Um, and it's only by the prying open of the two bifurcated mouths of the oyster, right? Again, very similar to that idea of the Y principle, bifur the bifurcation, um, the rendering or the rending of the singular essence into its uh, fractal essence, right, into the um, into dualism, into Cartesian dualism of the mind and the body, right, that you will then, un you will then be able to seek the, the peril which is in the middle between the two um, uh, jaws of oblivion, right. Um, so yeah, that's what that's speaking of there. Wait, hold on. There's something else I was going to look at. Where is it? Sorry, I've just closed closed it. And with my offering and my peril, and with him should present myself to our king. So again, it's uh, it's that. I, see, the thing is, the characters he's talking about here, he is absolutely every one. Every one of these characters, and that idea of the hymn of Judas Thomas, the apostles, which he spake in prison, is ended, right? Um, so it's that idea that he's speaking in prison. So what he's actually discussing here, um, that he's you know reached enlightenment in the physical world, he's speaking from prison. So all of this is sort of occurring in his, in his mind, right? And really what it's getting at is, firstly, it's getting at that idea that the beginning is the end, right? That you sort of wind up in imprisonment through this process of oblivion, right? That you're born into this world, what have you. But and inevitably you end up in prison. Um vis-a-vis -vis the sort of pursuit of knowledge, of truth. I mean, it could be speaking to that. Um, again, that endless horizon, right? It's this endless cycle that once you ascend, do you then descend again, eventually, right? Um, I mean, furthermore as well, it's even that idea of if he's speaking that from prison, then all of that is merely... Merely, merely a current within his mind. So, yeah, therefore, you know, you know that this is this is part of the Acts of Thomas. So, this is not yeah. a complete text. This is a part of. No, of course, of course. I mean, it's it just even in the context of this. I mean, him yeah. speaking that from prison. Thus, however, in his mind and in his spirit. He's reached somewhere where you could call it freedom, right? He's reached freedom. He's reached emancipation. Um, it's almost getting to that concept of the spirit creates the physical world. That the mind just isn't as it just is not a, a tool, an apparatus to process an inflow of information, but is that which processes the out it uh, projects the outflow reality. of yeah. something yeah it projects reality itself yeah. so you could be in prison but yet you you feel more emancipated than you ever have um yeah.
Interesting. Yeah. I just, yeah. It's, it's a very interesting text. Very interesting. Basically, it's speaking of exactly what we've been discussing here. Um, same principle. And it summarizes uh, so much um, if you really want to read into it, you know. <clears throat> oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Oh, it summarizes it all, essentially. <laughs> was, it, yeah. was it like eight, eight stanzas or so, or eight sections? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's eight sections, actually. I'm going to have to check that. <laughs> Let me guess, it is eight sections. Uh, where are we? No, it's uh, 21. Yeah. Is it 21? It's right. 21. <laughs> ah, right, okay. Oh, interesting. 21. Still 21. Fine. So that's uh, obviously three times seven. So again, there's the 37 connection again there. Of course, 21 reverse that, you get 12. Um, yeah, that's a interesting. Problem. You don't get the 22. So where is the 22? The totality of it. Yeah, is that the totality of it? Yeah. So you, yeah, like you get. Revelation. Revelation's the same. Yeah, yeah. Is is Revelation the twenty first chapter? No, it's it's twenty one chapters long. Yes, yeah, it's twenty one chapters long. Sorry, you're you're right. Yeah, yeah. Revelation. Thank What's Revelation know. in terms of the books? In terms of the books of the Bible, I forget the number that's, of it now. It's the last book, sixty six. 66th, yeah, 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 interesting, so that's the, the sort of 6 and 6, or again, if you looked the at the triune of the 22s, it's, yeah. you know, Route 66, which is kind of what you guys have been talking about as far as basically confronting yourself in the valley of the shadow of death. Yeah, and it goes from Genesis to Revelation. Never thought of it that way. That Route sixty six was was made as a representation, yeah, of the journey. <laughs> yeah. Um, never thought of it that way, really. Mm -hmm. It's in a lot well, of we've movies. We've heard so right? much. We've heard so much about that in movies and all that, and uh, mm -hmm. I never actually made the connection. Yeah. Hey, every day is a school day on this server. Yeah. <laughs> How long is it? Do you know, uh, Reagan? I don't know off the top of my head. Oh yeah, it's. Um, let me check. It's from Missouri to uh, Las Vegas. So, where is that? Yeah, it's from misery to Tulsa. Yeah. Yeah, from misery. <laughs> misery. Yeah, yeah. Two thousand four hundred forty-eight miles, or three thousand nine hundred forty kilometers. Yep. Damn. Mm. It looks and very much like the Atlantis. Specifically in Santa Monica. Mm. Oh no, Start you can actually Chicago. take it all the way back. Chicago, yeah. yeah. I thought that's it was like, around there somewhere. It does look like they had a Danis. What's uh, that? It's a, it's a constellation. Um, quite an important one. Again, it's it's linking to this idea of the sea serpent, and also, um, what's the sea serpent that's above it? Because the Eridanus is the river. Um, it, funnily enough, the, the Eridanus derives from the Sumerian Eridu, which uh, Eridu is the oldest city, according to the Sumerian, uh, it's the oldest city within Sumeria, the Sumerian civilization, And... Um, to the Sumerians, it was the first city, and it was the 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 patron deity that was revered there was called Ea, which was their term for water. Um, but funnily enough, that went by another name, Enki, which was the serpent. Yeah. Right? You could think of that as the Lucifer character. Um, literally, Enki means the Lord of the Earth. You see it within the Gilgamesh as Enki do. Which is um, obviously, if you look at that as the fool, uh, then Gilgamesh is, you know, if you 
transpose or project that onto the fool card or even to that I, uh, that story within the Hindu tradition of uh, Prince uh, Yudhisthira and uh, Svana, then Enkidu become, or literally the lord of the, the marshland, right? The idea of the dead land, the, you know, you have to go through the bog to get to enlightenment, all of this idea. Um, right. You can see that as Sirius as well. Uh, yeah. And of course, you see within the hermetic vision of poimandries, poimandries in Greek is a composite word. It means a uh, shepherd of man, a uh, shepherd of man. Um, so again, the demiurge act, actually acts as a uh, shepherd. It's a benevolent character. It's a necessary evil in the story. Um, shepherd, and it's shepherd of man, shepherd of man in the uh, age of Ares, and fisher of man in the age of Pisces. Yes, yes, that's an that's an interesting overlap or reflection there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eridanus is, um, uh, I, be I believe it's is it next to Pisces. Yeah, so it crosses the Phoenix constellation. Uh, yes, Cetus. Cetus, the, that is the name of the um, sea serpent or sea monster that is at the, the, the sort of beginning of the Eridanus. Yeah. Yeah. Set, no, Cetus is the second one. Orion is at the beginning of the Eridanus. So it goes from Orion to Cetus. Um, and goes all the way down. I forget what the, la the final one is. Um, right at the end of the Eridanus, the constellation that is. Yeah. So basically... Where is that? So you go from the east to the west, and you go to was it Lake Erie? Was uh, was Lake Chicago? Michigan? Lake Michigan, sorry. Yeah, you go to Lake Michigan. Yeah. Yep, that's so the you, Griswold's trip to uh, Wally World, right there. <laughs> but you go from east to west, essentially. Yeah, it's that, weird that because be, yeah, it, it, Chicago to. LA. The way the way it cuts it up, of course, um, Lake Michigan connects with. Oh God! Uh, essentially, uh, it goes here on here on Erie, know, that's that. and then Ontario, I think. Yeah, the Saint Lawrence and all that, the Saint Lawrence River, all the way up to yeah. the the estuary. So, essentially, that cuts in half along with Route sixty six. It cuts the entire United States between North and South, or the, the Americas between North and South. Well, um, it's, it's uh, North, East, uh, Southwest. Like, uh, actually, that's yes, pretty uh, close yeah. to what that eclipse path is going to be. Really? <laughs> yeah, because it's right. Right going right over uh, the St. Louis Arch, which is right, right. Missouri. Okay. Northwest, southeast in this case, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. No, no, oh. no. It's no, it's uh, southwest. South it's southwest. The eclipse north. is coming from southwest to northeast. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, anyway. okay. So it draws the line. Yeah, yeah. I understand what you mean. Okay. Yeah. I think I got one of those sitting around. That of 24 as well. eclipse been, has been talked about for since the 17 eclipse. Uh, of course as well, you have um, Oklahoma is very close to Kansas. Which, funnily enough, um, Nebraska, Kansas, those areas, um, I believe that that is like pretty much bang in the center of the United States. I believe Kansas is actually it's pretty much the, yeah. the geographical so, center. Uh, 
the geographic it's uh wherever Superman landed. Lawrence. Lawrence yes. Canada. I lived there for a while. Oh really? Ah, yeah. right. Well see that's interesting. Because why are they choosing the middle? <laughs> right? You even see it within uh, the Cross. Wizard of Oz. Yeah. It's the heart. It's the heart. So what did we read within uh, for example that uh where is it? The hymn of the, the peril. Hymn. We see uh let's um da, 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 da. where's the heart? It mentions the heart. Yeah. And with me they then made a compact in my heart wrote it not to forget it. If thou goest down into Egypt and then thou bringest the one peril. This <laughs> So it's essentially talking about this this idea of this esoteric idea of the Tiferet or the heart or the middle point, like what we've been discussing, right? That the Christ is between the polarities of evil. Yeah. Interesting. So it's between the Pacific and obviously the, the Atlantic. Atlantic. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. And of course, Orion. In this case, Atlantic would be uh, severity, and Pacific would be mercy because it's Pacific, right? Pacific yeah. is peace, and Atlantic is Atlas, the the Titan. So, yeah. Oh, Pacific is is what? Uh, Pacific means peace uh, in in Portuguese. Uh, Pacifico, Pacifico means oh, peace. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes, uh, from the Latin Pax, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's already in their oh. language, too, with, uh, you know, pacify, yes. to pacify. Yes. Yes. Pacify. Well, I, I have a, I may actually have a different take on that, slightly, so, mm -hmm. you see within, uh, where is it, but you see within the two pillars, right, so, of course, that idea of peace, how do you attain peace? It's a sort of paradox itself. You attain peace by destroying the competition. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, peace in that sense is the feminine axis of severity. It is the boaz or the strength. You only maintain peace by instilling fear into the opposition, thus mitigating it, neutralising it. That's done through strength. Atlantis is that which establishes, so even Atlas within the mythology, um, it, it, I believe the etymology actually it ties in with this, it means to bear, means to undergo, I believe, yes, to bear, to undergo, yes, to endure, so it's that which is the foundation, it's that which is the yakin, which from the Hebrew means to establish, it's the male axis of kindness, um, or mercy. Yeah, and also be, uh, but but mm -hmm. isn't atl um, the prefix atl meaning serpent? I I always Ooh. thought it was. Yes, I believe in a. Is it the Nahuatl uh, or Aztec languages? Yeah, I uh, believe uh, it does. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what uh, Tesla Coatl uh, and what yes, was the other? Yes. Um, um, and uh, Tetzcatlipoca. Um, Tetzcatlipoca, yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Or Yaot or Yaotl. Yaotl's and yeah. Yaotl another, and name another one. Um But maybe I'm there's... confusing things, but I always mm. thought that Atlas was like the son of serpent um, sort of Oh no. Sorry, it means Atl means water in the Aztec religion. Oh, okay. Okay. That's, uh, the Aztec language, sorry. Yeah. Oh okay. Okay. But yeah, well that you're still right, though. That still links to serpents or fish. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, they they abide within the water. The um, no, in that, in that sense, it wasn't. Uh, I was always considering it wrong because I actually thought that the word, the prefix "atl" mm. prefix or suffix "atl," was ah, um, right. implying serpent, and, and therefore I was incorrect there. But um, no, but no, yeah, no, I mean. It, well, I, I'm I'm just looking at the word itself. I don't know what the prefix may mean. Um, yeah, it's, it's still come up as war. 
Um, but it still links with still links with that. I mean, obviously as well, you have the atlatl, which is a spear thrower. But you would think atlatl has something to do with serpent, because of course the the atlatl itself and its ammunition are both sh shaped, you know, and, and they're sticks. They're shaped like that sort of serpent um, uh, shape. Yakuatl, water which reaches the heavens. Yakuatl. Hmm. Yeah. I wish it. I wish it meant serpent. <laughs> that would have been a oh, brilliant yeah. connection. I, I was, it's one of those things that we carry uh, for a long time, and we think that we know, but we don't. So yes. it's, good to, yeah. it's good to correct. So it's fine. But it's, I always thought that way. Yeah. There was something else I, I had as well. Uh, just today, I actually corrected myself. Um, and it was something I was mentioning to you guys. And it was not the etymology at all of it. I don't know where the hell I got it from. Um, I'm going to have, I'm gonna have to go back and change all my notes. Um, <laughs> so you get that. Yeah, you get that all the time. Um, I can't even fucking remember what it was now. <laughs> Pardon my French. New yeah. information. Yeah. Yeah. Right, guys, I'm going to have to go ahead, head to bed. I'm up early in the morning. I do apologize for my ramblings. It's a very oh, interesting yeah, topic. <clears throat> I talked course. a lot yesterday. We had a big party chat most of yesterday. Oh, a nice one. Uh -oh. Yep. No, I was going to get off too. That's what I'm getting tired. Um, things to do. But it was good. Good talking with you guys. Always love discussing all this stuff. We always learn something. <laughs> yeah. Oh, certainly. Certainly. Definitely. So you guys have a good I'll night. I'll see if I. Yeah, you as well. I'll see if I have that uh, ready for you tomorrow, Silas. Um, I'm halfway through. Oh, I appreciate that. I appreciate mm -hmm. that, man. It's, um, it's just I didn't, the, uh, I, I didn't uh, correct anything. I just put uh, highlights and little comments so that you see if uh, you want to change or not. So I didn't actually change anything, oh, just put um, highlights. No, that's, that's fine. It's just sometimes I miss... Um, it was like I, I just had to change that new book that I've published because I'd, mm. missed, I'd started typing. I must have fell asleep um, and then just moved on and never... I had I had a whole big section. Just I'd started Nothing. typing, and then and then I just stopped the, the thought. I had no punctuation or any period, you know, sentence stop. And then I went on to another paragraph, and I'm thinking, oh my god! So I had to change it, and then ah, oh, it was a bit of a, an annoyance. So. Uh, yeah, just having another proofreader there is is helpful. I appreciate it a lot. Thank you. No problem. All right. Um, right, I'll catch you uh, tomorrow or another day. Yeah, Have a good I'm, I'm. I'm going to put up this uh, recording tomorrow uh, sometime. Okay. Perfect. Right. Thanks a lot. See you. See you, man. Bye bye. Bye.